Good afternoon and welcome to the Sabi Sands. I'm Scott Dyson and this afternoon Brian is on camera and on the other vehicle we have Mark and Vim and in final control we have Alex. If you're wondering where Jason is, the last member of our coalition, he has had the weekend off and he's enjoying some time to rest and relax. So that's where he's been. And it's a nice and cloudy afternoon, which suits us perfectly. We're loving the cool weather. And that is something that we are really happy about over the last few days. Now, the plan is for myself and Brian to search around the central parts of Juma and then possibly head to the east and to the northern half and Mark's going to work the south western part and then possibly move off into Arethusa where he was this morning. So that's our rough game plan for the start of the drive and let's see what happens out there. I'm really hoping to find some sign of the resident leopards of Juma and there are three that we've seen quite a lot of. Two probably the most have been two young males, two brothers that are just over two years of age and they would be nice to find and come across and we have seen them probably more than any other leopard since we started filming a couple of months ago. And for Jeez, Brian, when last? Maybe four or five days ago? At least. At least. So it's been a long time since we've seen any of them, or their mother, Karula, but she hasn't been around as much as she usually is in these parts. We're not sure why, but territories do shift and that's normal for things to change out here. So she hasn't been spending as much time on this property, we think. Having said that, she could well have been here all this time and we just simply haven't been able to find her. But we haven't seen many of her tracks. If we had seen her tracks around and not found her, well that's a different thing, but we've seen a surprisingly low amount of her tracks in this area over the last few months. But the area that we're in now used to be kind of the center of her territory and she used to spend a lot of time here. And this is where I've seen her in this immediate area, kind of a one mile radius of where we are here. For any of you who may be joining for the first time, welcome. It's great to have you on board with us. And to all the regulars, welcome back. I saw on Twitter today, somebody's actually made a safari bingo. So depending on different actions that myself or Mark do, or comments, or Brian's got a few, also comments that he may make. So that's quite fun. So we do have a lot of regular viewers that we thank gratefully for watching and getting involved and making more out of it than you possibly could think, like a safari bingo game, so I was really surprised when I saw that and it's wonderful to see. And for the newcomers it's important to realize that it is an interactive safari so you can ask myself or Mark, the other presenter who you will meet shortly, you can ask us questions at any stage and to do that you would hashtag safari live on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv on email. Well, if the squeak on this vehicle is driving you mad, don't worry, it is also driving myself and Brian mad, and we are hoping that tomorrow being a Monday, we may be able to get a little bit done and fixed on this part that is squeaking. So bear with us. Hopefully we'll find an animal shortly and then be able to stop.
really love this area that we're driving through. And I'm just going to poke our heads down. There's a little track that we've discovered that runs down here. And we discovered this track when following the quarantine male, one of the two-year-old males, leopards that I mentioned we have been seeing quite a lot of. And actually, funnily enough, saw his brother just a few days later come down to this exact same spot. So it was obviously somewhere where they used to play and get left by their mother when they were growing up. So one of many places that they would have got to know very well in her territory, within her territory. And it's a beautiful spot down here. So I just thought I'd come down to have a look for a leopard and also just to enjoy the scenery. There's the thumb. So just to confirm it is Brian. He's still with us. And he's panning across to a beautiful, abnormally large buffalo thorn tree. And you'll notice a very horizontal branch that bends to the right of the tree. And that is exactly where the was lying a couple of weeks ago. as fast as possible to get it sorted. Welcome back. I'm sorry about the small technical issue that we encountered there. Not, not sure exactly what happened. And you wouldn't believe it, but literally 20 seconds ago, I asked Brian, where do you think all the carmine bee eaters have gone? Because we saw a few coming into the area and they are migratory. So they come from Central Africa down to the southern parts for our summer and we saw a few floating around further up into the Manuleti so a bit further north from here and when I did a trip into the Kruger I saw a few more and they should be here now and I did just ask I wonder why we haven't seen one and then I'm 80% sure we 30 seconds later saw one fly past and it was somewhere here that it landed but now we can't see it and a carmine bee eater is an incredibly incredibly beautiful bird so it would be really nice to show you one. And I just saw the back end of it flying off down here somewhere. Can't seem to find it. They like to often perch themselves on dead trees or branches. So that's mainly where I'm searching on any of the dead, dead trees. There's a couple up ahead here. And I also may have been wrong about the identification of that bird, but I'm fairly certain it was a carmine bee eater. Hmm. Well, they will pop up at some stage, I'm hoping. But it is strange that we haven't seen any here yet. Tail. Kink, rather, in his tail. Or kink, rather, in his tail. So, we have seen this one with food around. And one of their favorites is the marula fruits, and that is exactly what he's busy feeding on. So let's move a little bit closer, and we should be able to get some great shots of him popping these fruits into his mouth. This is going to be a great angle as well. Boop. So what's 
closely and you'll see a small round crease about the size of a golf ball getting popped into his mouth. His temporal gland evidently is sweating quite profusely, but maybe that's simply tears of joy for all this tasty food he's getting to feed on. And it's one marula fruit after the next. They chew them a couple of times, but basically just perforate the skin of the, the fruits, and some of the juices that way will then be absorbed. Desires from the tree. Well, it won't just fall now. You may have heard a very small thud. There's another one. Oops. So I guess they are falling, but not at the same rate at which he's feeding. He's feeding far faster than they're falling. Which may mean, if we were very lucky... Oh, well, there we go. Making space for more. And they do this about every 45 minutes, and usually drop out about four or five of those boluses, which will probably each weigh about two kilos, I'm guessing, and he's having a proper defuel, making space for more delicious goods out here, and if we're lucky he may push the tree for us, and I'm hoping he might do that right now in order to get more marula fruits to drop down. It really is awesome because we all hear a lot of them come tumbling down from this tree. Come on, give it a push for us. Please. Such a beautiful marula tree. I really like the way it's got a very angular trunk as opposed to the regular vertical one. It makes it almost like a perfect staircase for leopard to climb up. going to keep creeping forward. We might be able to get a great low angle shooting up on him. There's a little depression here that we can go down. Oh, hello boy. Getting too close to his marulas it appears. make a difference the angle that you film or photograph from and I can really see the difference it gives a better portrayal of their size when you shoot from ground level the camera is mounted quite high on the back of the vehicle so that is something to bear in mind I'm just going to stay because he is moving around quite a bit and may move back into shot rather than repositioning because of all these different angles of this little depression we go down it makes it difficult for Brian to re-level the camera every time we stop on an uneven surface which is basically every time <laughs> but we try and avoid it where we can <laughs> thankfully though this next maneuver May. Oh, he didn't like the sound of the vehicle running or not running. He heard it just creeping there. And when it didn't make the sound of the, or the engine, when the engine wasn't running, he got a little bit of alarmed. Slowly, boy.
rather than moving forward or backwards now I'm just going to leave the vehicle running and let him realize that he overreacted there potentially and he needs to calm down oh sorry <laughs> and he might now go and quench his thirst which is perfect so wherever the zoom is on the webcam at the Voyatel Dam now's your time to get active because he's about to come into your shot Beautiful reflection in the water. And he's slowly quenching his thirst. Really enjoying this reflection we're getting of his. And the beautiful dark clouds in the background, the sunlight shining on him. This has just turned into an incredibly beautiful sighting. Look at that. Well, that is a wonderful scene of Africa right there. Oh, and there's a hippopotamus in the dam. Please go for a swim. Come on, you know you want to. Absolutely marvelous. I'm gonna need to change lenses quickly because he's now got a little bit too far away from my wide angle. And this is a beautiful shot and angle we have of him here, as you can see. But will I be able to capture this moment with my camera? I'm not sure. Beautiful. Go ahead, Alex. Steve on Twitter is just asking how many holes or nostrils. Oh, look at him catching the water droplets. That was incredible. I hope you all saw that. He was catching the water droplets from his mouth in the base of his trunk there. And there are two nostrils in his nose, just like ours. But good question, and glad you asked that. So just like us, there are two, two nasal passages that run up that trunk. So you probably would be able to see that, but sadly, not from this angle. Yo, this is wonderful. Come on, go for a swim, you know you want to. Yes, you do. Look at this. With the hippo in the background. 
This is just marvelous. He's warming up to it or deciding against it, but I'm hoping he's going to come deeper into the water. Birchall's cuckoo, or the rain bird calling doo -doo 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 in the background. There amongst lots of other birds, but that's a distinctively recognizable call. just playing around and loving, just throwing that water around wherever it so pleases him. It's like he's chewing on his trunk there almost. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Not a worry in the world for this elephant at the moment. And that's how it should be. Sadly, it's not the case in a lot of parts of Africa. They are still heavily persecuted for their ivory in many parts of Africa, especially the countries that don't have good tourism and are less traveled to. Their wild places are sadly not very well protected because without any revenue coming in from tourism it does make looking after these animals very difficult and expensive so sadly a lot of the time they are not as playful as this when humans are around What will his next move be? Will he potentially attack the hippo or will he pick on the Egyptian geese and their goslings? He is certainly playful, so it wouldn't surprise me if he did chase over after those geese that you can see in the background. And it is phenomenal to see how quickly those little goslings have grown. I surprisingly didn't come past this dam for about a week, which is hard to believe. But I only realized that I hadn't been here for so long when in a week's time, in a week of not being here, I came past and saw how big those goslings were and had doubled in size at least. So, good to see that they're still doing well. And last time I did check, there were still seven of them. So, it's been a highly successful brood for those two parents. Maybe it's time for some scratching or back to feeding for the elephants. Whew, it's cooking now that the sun's come out. I'm certainly happy it did come out though because that sighting that we've just had certainly was intensified by the beautiful sunlight that came through just as we or just as he started to drink. I 
wonder if he's back to the same marula tree or if he's going to mix up the diet now for a while. Looks like he's happy for a little bit of grass in the meantime. Okay, well, let's just see what he does here. We'll give him a few more minutes and then possibly go and catch up with Mark and see what he's up to, how his afternoon's been so far. I haven't heard any updates from him yet, but he may well have Okay, copy Alex, thank you. Well, Mark sadly, for some reason, is having technical difficulties. We're not picking up his signal from his vehicle at the moment, but they are working on it. And I'm sure it won't be long before they fix that little glitch. But like I say, that's not a major issue. He'll still be out there searching for animals, and if he does find anything, even if he doesn't have signal, we'll be able to shoot across to wherever he is and broadcast whatever the most exciting thing that's going on here to you. <coughs> well, just for interest sakes, I'm keeping an eye on that Ellie to see if he does go back to that same marula and I think he might but time for us to continue yeah he's back under the same marula so he was just having a quick drinks break and then back to the marulas Dragonflies here. Do you think you'll be able to get them, Brian? They're all literally just hovering around us here. It's going to be very difficult, but maybe worth a try now they've moved. There's one. But there's like ten of them just hovering around us. drive off the road there to check for any tracks that may have been heading away from the dam but no sign of anything.
stuck in the shade. The squeaking is about to send me over the edge, folks. So I'm going to get out some lubricant spray and spray some on there to see if that doesn't help. If not, you just may see me walking off into the distance. Sadly, no lubricant spray. But we have tried to do that and it doesn't help, but I just needed to do something at least to give myself peace of mind that I've tried something. we've had a bit of sunshine like this may entice out the reptiles to bask in the sun somewhere which is useful for us trying to find them a that they'll be a bit sluggish after all the cool weather and b that they'll be hopefully exposing themselves in the sunlight to try and warm up Just a reminder that weather permitting, which is looking good for now, there will be a fireside chat this evening. And for those of you who are new, the fireside chat is basically just a one hour extension of the regular drive that continues after regular drive time from seven o'clock till eight o'clock our time. And myself and Mark will be sitting around a campfire and answering any questions you may have and just having a catch up on what's happened over the last week. So that's something to look forward to. Thank <laughs> you. 
Come on, animals, where are you all hiding? Where are you hiding? Good afternoon, Winlin on Twitter. Let me just get into position here. Don't you move the muscle bird. Right there. Beautiful. Now, this is a dream shot of a beautiful light at Crested Roller. Perfect sunlight and a relatively dark cloud behind it. And Winlin, I am going to answer your question shortly. And Winlin is asking a question that's directly related to what we're looking at right here. And that is why birds prefer or favor dead trees to sit on as opposed to leaves with foliage. And I guess it's just because it's easier to hunt prey from a dead tree for the smaller birds because you've got a better view of your surroundings. So that could well be a reason. Yes, I do hear your point that it's better cover with, in, to be seated in a tree with foliage, but... Oh, I missed it. But I think it is from a hunting perspective, the smaller birds, a, a dead tree is easier to see around you. For the bigger birds like vultures, it's easier to land and take off from a dead tree. There's less interference from thorny branches or anything like that. Less things to get a big wingspan stuck in. But it is a good question how some do favor dead trees to others. I think a lot of the time we see dead birds perching in, or dead birds, birds perching in dead trees is also because they nest in them a lot of time. For example, these two virtual starlings that we can see in this dead tree I'm guessing are actually feeding into a nest. No, maybe that's too thin for a nest. But their nest could well be in this dead leadwood tree. And therefore will perch themselves on there fairly often. Beautiful. Yeah, a lot of brown-headed parrots calling off in the distance. They're far away. Too far away to show, sadly, Brian. Let's see what happens. You see the tree with the white branches on the kind of horizon there. Now if we... There we can see them actually fluttering around, cool. So if you stay on the top of that tree, you will notice there's a slightly green patch. That is a brown-headed parrot. And if we just wait a moment or two, we may see them fly about. I know it's very far, but we hear these birds so often, but I've certainly haven't been able to show you any. There goes a couple. Cool. So... You may have got an idea that that is a parrot-like bird, even though it is very far away. And it's the only parrot we get in this area of the Kruger Park, but there are others that you get further north from here. And we could hear them screeching from a long way away. When Brian zooms back out, you'll realize how far away that tree is. But their screech screeching call carries a long distance. 
Well done. I'm glad we attempted that. His nest has been raided. I'm not sure by who. Nesters. It could be nearby. It's two different eggs that have been fed on. This one's still full. It's been perforated, but it's still full of yolk. So it's strange. It's a very strange scenario. I can't see any tracks here that help me mm. establish what it may be. And I'm not sure what kind of bird would have laid those eggs. Very interesting. I'm guessing it may have been a bird that fed on them, especially judging by the the hole that was perforated into this egg here. Looks like a beak may have perforated it. Oh well. Sadly, somebody lost two of their eggs. Not sure who it was or who performed the crime. Interesting nonetheless, especially considering we, we drove down this road this morning and nothing was here. I'm also wondering how the egg would have got transported to such a point. Or two eggs from where the nest was. Hmm. And why the other egg wasn't fed on? That's bizarre. It's such a tasty meal, nutritious meal. You'd have thought it would have all been consumed and usually there is no waste in nature. And look, that will not be wasted. That will certainly be fed on by some smaller insects, I'm sure. Or anything that comes across it. A hyena would even eat that if it came across it, no doubt. That's when you need a camera trap. Rig up the camera trap, see what happens, come back, and you've got evidence to see what happened. It's a toy that I certainly want to invest in, or possibly several, because imagine how much fun it would be putting a few up around Juma or any area where you're on safari, and every morning you drive past one of the traps, and you can see, a lot, I mean, a lot of them send SMS updates of pictures as soon as they're taken. So they get you get some really high tech ones. But even if you get a me medium range or a medium yeah, kind of range one, you can go and on the little LCD monitor at the back of the camera trap, you can flick through, see what may have passed by in the night. 
very fun toys to have. There's also a termite mound that we know used to be used as a hyena den site. It's also been used by porcupine in the past over the years, according to Mark. And we can see there's something living in there because of the fresh excavations, but we're not sure exactly what it is. So it would be so nice to put up a camera trap there and we would there after one night know exactly what is living in there. Now we've got some beautiful, beautiful antelope around this next corner that I'm hoping are going to stay exactly where they are because the sunlight will be magnificent on them. There you go. Hello lads. And those are two exceptionally beautiful kudu that have just passed by. There's actually three of them now that I've seen but Two are certainly more magnificent than the other third one. And now we're going to have a wonderful low angle that I was speaking about earlier that also makes a difference. The male with the biggest horns that you can see now in the center of the shot does have a magnificent set of horns. They are kind of abnormally wide at the top, which makes them stand out from the rest. Just driven over a whole big buffalo. Pat, I was wondering what was smelling funny. But it's just the big buffalo pat that we've driven through. Nothing to be alarmed about. I mean, look at the spread of those horns. It's incredible. Especially, yeah, that gives you a good perspective as he faces directly away from us. And just like the elephant, these could are enjoying the bountiful summer. Copy that, Alex. No problemo. So, shame, I'm not sure what the issue is, but Mark's vehicle is still not receiving any signal. But they are still working on it. But for now, you are stuck with me and Brian, so sorry about that. We'll try and make it as entertaining as possible. Mark, what you up to? Where are you checking? Where have you been? Copy that, Alex. It might be, might be more useful for him to look for animals and do that later, but that's just a suggestion.
Thought I'd seen a leopard track there, but it was yet another false alarm. Doing a quick flyby past Twin Dams. We spent a decent amount of time here and had a wonderful actually morning. With a lot of interaction between buffaloes and there was a lot of things going on here. Woodlands kingfisher swimming. I thought I saw a small golden patch on a termite mound off to the side of the road there. But it was a golden patch of dirt, not a golden patch of leopard, sadly. Alex, did you copy my, my last message? Alex, did you copy my last message? Copy, thanks. Sorry, my earpiece just died on me again, but it's all good now.
major highways to get to major cities or major places of interest to you, work or whatever it may be. But then once you get off those highways that take you into the general area that you're trying to go, then you'll use smaller paths and smaller roads and it's the same for the animals. They may use our road networks as their kind of major highways and then smaller trails through the blocks in order to fine tune wherever they want to go. But they certainly do use the roads a lot for traveling on. If you look on my Facebook page, Scott Dyson Safaris, you will see some pictures from two nights ago of two Salati male lions walking down one of the roads. And we were stuck behind them for about half an hour, just thick vegetation either side, and we couldn't get around them. Not that we wanted to leave them, but we are obliged to get back to the Manyaleti camp by a set time, and we were certainly late two nights ago. Oh, awesome, there it is, Brian, can you see it? If you just follow the right-hand fork, first fork of this tree. I can hear that bird calling. It's an emerald spotted wood dove, and Brian's just getting ready to take you up to it. It's an incredibly pretty bird. Just a little bit further up. There we go. And it is facing away from us now. Let's see his whole body moving. Beautiful, but you can see those little emerald windows. Those two emerald spots. They're incredibly beautiful little doves, these. They're about half the size of the Cape Turtle Dove. Beautiful. We see them a lot, but sadly they are quite shy and nervous. So we seldom get to see them as well as we are looking at them now. It would be interesting if one responds to its call, similar to the Cape Turtle Doves that were calling this morning. One came and landed on a branch next to the one that was calling. Let's see if this one manages to serenade a lady in. Certainly trying his best. And I guess he does have to make sure he looks good for when she arrives, so that's probably why he was just checking his feathers there. Phenomenal how such small birds can make such a loud noise. I think he might turn around and that then face us when he does this call. So we'll give it a few minutes to see if he doesn't try and change his position. I'm not sure if it's got a thorn stuck in its head. 
It does have something stuck in its head. You can just see it protruding. If I roll back ever so slightly, no, that's not going to work. But there does appear to be something very small sticking out of the top of his head. I'm not sure if you can see it. It doesn't look like a feather, so possibly, I don't know, he flew into a thorn tree or something. No, he's got a very strange decoration coming out of his the top of his head. Can you see it in the picture there, Brian? Mm -hmm. There, there's a side angle. You can see something. That's better. Hard to establish what it is, but there is something stuck in its head. Doesn't seem to be affecting his behaviour, though. If anything, maybe it's putting pressure on the calling part of the brain, and that's why he hasn't stopped calling since we've got you. Very relaxing call, that. And a nice alarm clock tone to wake up to. And he's enjoying a beautiful big apple leaf tree. Jeffrey in Texas, good afternoon and welcome on board. Jeffrey's asking whether there are plants here that have edible berries or fruits, and there certainly are. The marillas have a large fruit, almost kind of like a plum, I guess. The little berries from the raisin bush are tasty, almost sugar coated once they dry out. What else in terms of berries? None that come to mind. I'm sure there are a host more, but there certainly are some edible fruits out here. And at this time of year, it's the marula fruit that is the most popular amongst both the humans and the animals. Afternoon, go ahead for Scots. Afternoon, Cedric. Um, no updates here. Um, there was no ingwe or anything found this morning. Not much sign of anything either. So, just a handful of and love floating about.
no, nothing and check the whole perimeter, so highly unlikely that there's any around on us. Come here. That was one of the Arethusa guides, just hoping to get some good news from us, but not much to report for him. I'm on Shabam Road, uh, checking around this area. Checking around Shibam Road, I'm not sure which radio one, uh, Mark. Well, this guy's got a perfect spot in a mud water in the shade. What a perfect spot to unwind and chew the cud. The other one wasn't in as in a relaxed mood as this individual and went off huffing and puffing. As do buffalo a lot of the time. You enjoy yourself here, old man. We are off to look for slightly more vibrant creatures than you at the moment. Your friends did a great job for us this morning, though. At Twin Dams. Just got a question through from Sienna. Hello, Sienna, and welcome on safari. Sienna is eight years old, and she is wondering what we should do, or what we would do if we did get stuck out here in the bush. What would be the best thing to do to survive? And I'll just take it that we're going to spend one night out here only, not a long period of time. But even if it was a long period of time, we could just keep on performing the same model. But the safest place to be, Sienna, when stuck out here, especially at night time, during the day I'd be happy to walk around, because it's a lot safer during the day. But at night it can be very dangerous because we can't see, the animals can, well, especially the predators. So what I would do is I would climb up a tree, and tie myself to it, even if I had to use my belt, I would strap myself into the tree and spend the nights up there. That would be your safest place, probably. And thankfully, if you do know a little bit about the animals in the area and how to treat them and how to act when they may be aggressive towards you, 
you can avoid getting yourself into dangerous situations a lot of the time. So it's not as dangerous as it may appear to be, especially if you do know a little bit about what to do and what not to do when you're out here. But good question, Sienna. I certainly wouldn't like to be stuck out here for a night. It would be a scary, a scary 12 hours. But good question. Thankfully, I haven't been stuck out here yet purposefully. Sometimes we may, you know, we go camping and that is fairly similar to being stuck out in the bush because we only have minimal equipment, especially if we're going out to remote and rugged areas. We may only have a thin mosquito net or a very thin tent to protect us from the animals, but that's all you need. miraculously following a butterfly <laughs> around. I slowed down to see if... Coming behind the bush. Yeah. It it's too high though now. Can you get it still? Let's keep trying. Oh, it was floating around us very slowly initially. Hardly moving and Brian did manage to lock on but it moved off very quickly. <laughs> and sadly it is no longer. But he did do a good job on staying on it initially. Cicadas, bugs that make that huge noise. So these little love bugs do certainly appear to be a type of cicada or cicada, maybe your pronunciation in the States for those of you who are in the States. They make a high pitched almost technical buzzing sound that sometimes viewers actually complain that there's something wrong with our audio but it's not it's just these bugs making their noise and they've got a beautiful emerald green sheen to their coat not their coat really their exoskeleton I guess would be a better term Well, I guess we shouldn't overstay our welcome here. And we'll leave them to their business. But very interesting to see. First time I've ever seen a cicada bug of that coloration, but it certainly does have that appearance. I could be wrong. But it does have a very distinctly cicada-like shape. That's worth trying to snap a picture off of. Just for reference purposes.
That should do it. Oh, the sunlight on that beautiful emerald green now. Really is fantastic. Well, if any of you know your bugs, I'd be interested to know what you think those may be. Mark may well know the answer to exactly what that is because he is exceptionally knowledgeable with things like that. <laughs> Alex just gave Mark an update as to what's going on and he, and he described the, those bugs as mysterious green insects that we'll discuss later. So I found that quite amusing. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> mysterious green insects they are indeed. Folks, there's great news, and it appears that Mark and Vim are back with us, and then no doubt would like to say hello to you and fill you in on what they've been up to this afternoon. So, over to Mark and Vim as soon as you are ready, and we'll catch up with you a little bit later. Beautiful blue sky, fun day Sunday. Welcome to Wendy and welcome to my vehicle. Wow, what an incredible change from this morning from overcast and really grey, windy, and almost autumn kind of temperatures back to summer in less than a day. Sorry I couldn't join you earlier, but we've been having a few hiccups and we've finally sorted them out thanks to Alex and Alex and Pete and the technical side of things also to Vim. My name is Mark by the way, Vim is on camera and we're gonna head out and we're gonna see what we can find for you on the side of Juma Game Reserve. Maybe we'll head over to Arethusa and see what we can see. I'd like to tra travel over to the airstrip. I think a blue sky Sunday like this is it's, it's worth it to go and, and see those wonderful green grasslands out there and see what they might be. So without further ado let's move on. We've been quite busy, despite the fact that we haven't been on air. Uh, we haven't been brought. Somehow we've had a signal issue with Wendy that we finally sorted out, and it gave us the opportunity to prearrange a few things with for fireside chat. Magpie shrike digging at something in the road just ahead. Don't want to disturb him. It's not digging. It's killing something in the sand. This might be interesting. Oh no, just taking the easy way out, hopping around catching things. Not likely ants, but I'm not sure what it could be. Maybe we can creep up on it since it's preoccupied with something. No, there's no creeping up on the shrike. Normally they hunt from a perch. Normally they're sitting on the perch and they'll look out for insects, dive down and catch them. They're not much for hawking insects, catching them in the air, but mostly they perch. So it's Must have found a good source of food here. So the resident family of magpie shrikes that live in this little area, we could probably actually name them the way we name leopards if we could find a way to differentiate them. And they, that would be with maybe the white markings on their wings. Hello, baby. Hmm. 
<coughs> Mongoose and another shark, one of the younger ones, I think. Oh no, it's, pretty, it's an adult too. Very long tail. Longer than the other one. Of course they damage their tails. Got to imagine how it is diving into these long grasses after insects. The tail gets damaged, so the feathers get damaged, and when feathers get damaged, they get ejected, or rejected, rather. And new ones grow in their place. Much like we have hairs that get broken and split and rejected, and we grow new hairs, and everybody sheds. that they're all quiet now we've been past this family of strikes when they've been very noisy and that was just prior to this recent weather and it's kind of location I suppose now after the rain it's all about feeding because they've had a few days of, of adverse weather condition I suppose when it's cold not that many insects flying around or jumping around and so their feeding gets a little bit or their hunting is a little bit more difficult. I'm just gonna just mention something. Okay, just drop stuff off. We couldn't unpack anything in case of baboon or elephant or hyena. Other. So, it'd be great to hear from you wherever you are in the world. Questions at wildearth.tv or tweet at hashtag safari live. It'd be nice to hear from you, especially if you're a new viewer and you little unsure of things. You know, we don't always have to say your name, you always remain anonymous. Just say hi from Greece or Guten Tag from Germany or Buenos dias from Espania. Aloha from Hawaii. Jumbo from Kenya. So let's get into the serious business of what African wildlife we can find for you this afternoon. Let me just listen to the radio. Right. Hear what they're saying. Have to wait till we closer. We. Uh, I'm going to try and do a little bit of Arethusa, just a little bit around the airstrip. Is there any alleys or something to see? We had a wonderful sighting of Shadow this morning, one of Karula's cubs. Karula is a leopard that has been around for, well, she's a 10 year old cat now. She's a mature cat. I met her when she was a young mom. I met her when she'd only had her second litter. She was only about four years old at the time. And four years old for a second litter mom was quite something. And she was already an incredible leopard then. We were also lucky enough to know her mother. Her mother was a remarkable leopard by the name of Safari. We lost an eye. And it seemed that she lost a lot of the, the, the muscle and the, the... Well, anyway, she had quite a grotesque eye. She was a beautiful leopard nonetheless. Oh, more dwarf mongoose. 
Hello children. Yes, sorry. Shouting at us. Carrying something. I saw that. And it looked like a buffalo weaver carrying something, which is unusual. The only thing they carry really are sticks. Oh, it's a drongo. Can you see it through there? Drongos don't normally carry things in their claws, talons. It's got something. I can see it. That's a grasshopper. I can see a, one of those spiny legs kicking at the face of the drongo. And it's probably trying to break off those back spiny legs of the grasshopper so that it can eat it. Should we try and move forward or... Maybe not even move at all. This is the fork-tailed drongo. You often hear us talking about fork-tailed drongos and it's not always easy to catch them. Not busy. Well, it's busy. It's busy eating something, but normally they're, they're just busy flitting around and being clowns. Uh, that's sort of the equivalent of an eagle tearing apart a hare or something. It is only a grasshopper, so, but it, it's not just a grasshopper. It's probably about just as gruesome as a leopard killing an impala, because the concept is still the same. It is still kill to eat and live and kill to survive, and to do that something has to die. It's wonderful when we drive around and we see all the animals in their peaceful states without the dangers of predators or without predators chasing them or without the the raw brutality of what it means to have to kill something and eat it. Thank you, Drongo. Saved us the rest of that gruesome sight. Except we can just change angles and see if we can see it again. Looking into the sun. Mm. No. It's taken it to another tree. Well, no matter what scale it is, whether it's a drongo feeding on a grasshopper or a lion on a buffalo, or a leopard on a baby impala, or a hyena on a baby leopard. It's, it, it is, this is what we are here for. We are here to be a witness to the very essence of what nature can offer us, to the very thing that nature is. And most of the time we are enthralled and we awed and we are humbled and we stare open mouthed at mouth at, at some wonderful things and most of the time there is this wonderful feeling of peace and harmony and no real danger at all but every now and then something happens that just brings it all to reality and it could just be that very thing just a fork-tailed drongo eating a grasshopper it's still a harsh environment out here they are still in in every form that that food chain acting itself out, something eats something and being eaten. Consumers and producers well, the producers and consumers and predators. And the very thing that keeps the whole system going. Uh, you might hear about the balance of nature. There isn't really such a thing as a balance because everything fluctuates so much that it never really reaches a balance and nothing in fact every single species in existence on the planet nothing would really survive if there was a balance and we all are, are led to believe that nature is this balance in nature everything is balanced it's not balanced because if there's balance there's no need for adaptation there's no need for change and, and, and change and adaptation are the very things that drive a species to rise up and and, and occupy a niche that will take a lot to be for to be displaced or for another animal to take over that niche.
Since we're heading back up to the airstrip at Arethusa, I thought I would take this opportunity to revisit a, a flower. I found one this morning, and just after that I found a second one, and I'm going to revisit it this afternoon, only because we might not have this opportunity much more, or also because they're flowering now, who knows when they're going to stop, and although it might still be a month, if we get good rains. If we don't have any more rain, then it's not likely we're going to see them again. There was a second one. Oh, we're going to be looking into the sun for the second one. The sun, second one was quite far in. But the first one's to the road. And I know that there are a lot of you that might not have been with us early this morning because it could have been your middle of your night. That's why we have to see the flame lily. Oh, we love a spot now. Oh, we love. Just checking. Tell you lots. I tell you that jewel beetles are some of the oldest beetles. Just passed it again because here's the wood. I mean this this branch. Lark can live in wood for up to 40, 45 years. The wonderful, wonderful flame lily. I couldn't bear to only show people this morning. I had to show some of you this afternoon. So a very special flower. I missed the other one that's further in, but we've got this in setting. Kind of able to look into the light. Alex have been working on looking for the name of a beetle that he found and I'm jealous because he found it but I'm not going to reveal any information. Great work on being able to take him to find the answer. to our shadow this morning. We had a wonderful so we wander around a little bit up to the airstrip and I'll see if I can get hold of oh what was that? There's something in this tree. Monkey. Monkeys. Monkeys. Uh, I just saw some shadow with a tail and I got a bit excited. And well it's a primate, it's a monkey. If we can see one of them. I'm sure they're going to poke their heads out because they're curious and inquisitive. Maybe his name is George. The first one that pokes its head out is going to be called George. Except there's nobody poking their head out. They're shy. Little primates. Some vivid monkeys that were there.
Marco, good afternoon to you. Great oil for ice afternoon, I suppose. Hi, Marco. Marco's in New Jersey. I've got some friends in Woodcliffe Lake in New Jersey. Some very, very special people. Great safari company called Hippo Creek Safaris. Woodcliffe Lake, I think it is. Marco wants to know what other primates we have in South Africa, well, here at Juma, actually, not only South Africa, but more precisely here in Juma. Apart from, we, well, Marco knows, as he mentioned, the, the baboon and the vervet monkeys. Uh, and also, Marco wants to know if we have any nocturnal primates. Marco, the only other primates we have, really, are two species of nocturnal primates. The vervet monkeys and the chakma baboon are the only two diurnal primates that occur here. However, there have been rare sightings of Samango monkey coming into the sort of western edge of Kruger as far as I know. And I'm trying to think, I'll have to rack my brains, but I remember somebody saying there was a Samango monkey in a place, I think it might have been Will Fox in Leidenberg, of all places, that uh, he and Tara and the, and the Leopard Research Crew that they have a Tabatolo up in, 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 Leiden, in the Leidenberg area on the Leopard Research Camp that they had a Samango monkey that appeared on their camera and that is, that is truly remarkable. I mean there's Samango monkeys on the coast. I'm sure they reached down into the northern Pazulu and Taos. But I don't think there's ever been Samango monkeys. But I don't think there's ever been Samango monkeys in this part of the world. But that is it for our, pri our, our di diurnal primates, the vervet monkeys and the chakma baboons. But our nocturnal primates are the two species of bush baby or galago or galago that we, we find here. And the one is uh, galago crassicordatus, which is, as the, if, you, if you break down the name, is the thick-tailed bush baby or the thick-tailed galago, galago, galago or galago. Tomato, tomato kind of thing. Depending on how you want to pronounce it. Depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, this is where Shadow was this morning, by the way. She crossed this, she came out of here. We left her when she was just a car on the tomato mound on our, on our left. And, uh, and she was up there. And then she carried on and stalked some nyala. I if she was just successful enough. Anyways, the thick-tailed bush baby is very much a, a, a what's well, a large bush baby. It's about the size of a, it's a little bit bigger than a vervet, or well, maybe the size of a big adult male vervet, or the weight. They have different, they, they have different bone structures. So, nice little old dandy. I like. And where was I? See, that wasn't on the bingo card, or was it? Airstrip, we, we, I'm into this airstrip. I'm addicted to how things change here daily and how some things stay the same. Because it's a lovely big open area that we have, haven't really had access to in the past. So we're getting back to bush babies, we've got the thick-tailed bush babies which tend to mostly only favour the permanent rivers where there are certain trees that provide a lot of fruit for them because they are, although I suppose they are omnivorous, they 
they, to some extent, they mostly prefer fruits and things. So we don't really have them around Juma. We, I've never heard them. But most certainly everywhere else around the dry bush belt, you get this, probably the smallest primate we have, not probably, it's undoubtedly, uh, the smallest primate that we have here in this part of South Africa, which is the Lesser Galago or uh, Galago. That's uh, Galago senegalensis. Um, that's the subspecies is, I think it was an H. Forget. Zebra wildebeest impala, really beautiful sight actually. Everybody's enjoying a little bit of a warmer afternoon. Fortunately, after this low pressure cold front moved past, we've yet to return to the hot humid summer afternoons in the high 30s I think we're probably only close to the high 20s right now so it's, I'd say it's pretty much almost room temperature it's about the most perfect temperature not hot not cold just mild and that allows everybody to be out in the open in the afternoon which is quite a sight to see Normally when it's hot they'll only come out onto the open in the late afternoon. That's quite nice, that zebra with beautiful light. In fact we just missed the spot. It's got to go back an inch or two. But it had a... There, there's the shine there because we got the angle right. There was a whole line of about a half a dozen whack, uh, sorry, red bull oxpeckers. lined up on its back here are you guys two impala rams sparring an incredible peaceful scene bachelor herd of impala there's a breeding herd of impala further back lots of impala all that's missing is an elephant Interestingly, a different group of wildebeest from this morning because these are three bulls. So this is a small bachelor group of, of big bulls. We don't see it too often at the moment, up till now really. We've been mostly seeing the single bull harem syndrome where you have a bull that has a territory. It'll be interesting if the bull, the wildebeest who lives here, who was chasing a young male off today, it'll be interesting to see if he turns up because I don't think he'll tolerate these three boys. Most of the bachelor herd running off to the south, or rather the north, we facing south, um, running off to the north. And I'm guessing that the rest of the herd might, this bachelor herd might start following. I've 
wildebeest. Two of them were rubbing horns earlier, not in a in an offensive way, more than just in a camaraderie sort of way. Hard to believe actually they don't have territories because all three of them are really strapping big bulls. Strapping, is that the word you can use for a wildebeest? Muscular, yes, they are very deep in the chest. They are pretty strong bulls. Those two might interact now. Just a, just a nudge. It's not fighting. They don't. There's no, at the moment, there's no need to fight. Breeding season isn't till a couple of months away. When they're going to need to find themselves an open area, and maybe this is what they're doing: is they're sussing it out to see whether it's viable to come and fight for this when it's time to establish a territory. The wildebeest work in a little bit of a different way to a lot of other antelope, where other antelope... Well, let's talk about wildebeest. But the wildebeest finds himself a territory, and if he's strongest, if he, in the area, in, in, in the immediate region, he finds one of the best territories, one of the best access to water and grazing and open area and a place where he can rub his horns on a tree where he can dig in the dirt and roll in the dirt and where he can make a midden uh, it's called a lek where he can where, or a bowl where his bowl becomes his territory and the best territory the best bowl attracts the best group of females because they're also looking for a really nice safe place to live to not only conceive but to carry through their pregnancy and come back and and lamb carve rather they don't have lambs they have calves and when they've carved to be able to have the safety of the open area for their calves in the evening and so you have a slightly different case scenario where some of the best females will choose some of the best males territories it's the females that move through areas rather than males trying to find females and herd them to an area like the Impala. And I think slowly but surely that bachelor herd, as with this one walking through the background now, um, looks like most of this bachelor herd are going to start heading north. I am, I'm seeing stalks. And I'm seeing the second white stalk here now. We looked for it this morning. Hard to see it from here, but just amongst the Impala up ahead are the two white heads of the, the white stalks. Might be even more than two. I think it's only two. Let's try and get closer. Lesser black wing plovers. Lesser black wing lap wings. Excuse me. Thank you. I know they talk Shabikut. Oh, there's the other one. The one on the left is the one we always see. The one that's moving up towards that termite mound is the one that's. I think. Uh, must have a little bit of a wing flap against towards each other.
And the jackal, look at that. There's the jackal lying on the airstrip in the shade of the grasses. So, a few things here. Let's, I'm going to try and look at the stalk. The impala actually chasing it. And if I could get it focused. that it actually flew allows me to see its feet and it doesn't have a ring or maybe that's the one that we've been looking at it's important for me to be able to try and find a stalk with a ring on because I think it would be quite amazing for us to be able to find a stalk that has a ring that can be identified from where it comes in Europe and actually have people from that area watching live seeing a stalk that they might even know where its nest is for me it's such an amazing thing which is one of the reasons why i'd love to come back here as often as i can in the next couple of weeks well two weeks and until we're ending and have a look at these birds but i only hope that maybe as the time comes closer for them to be heading back to europe that we'll get more of them maybe accumulating here. I don't know if we're going to be able to maybe creep up on Jackal. We haven't had much time with been watching it. In fact there's still a few that are actually watching it. And on its own can't really do much to a big impala ram but on its own it could certainly do something to an impala lamb. Seeing this afternoon up here are most of them, they all rams. So, yes, yeah, they're all rams. It's a huge group of impala rams. Okay, child, don't run away. Come on, come and lie down in the shade. I don't know if it was me or if it was the impala that chased it. Oh, it's the impala. Not happy with the jackal. Thank you, Mr. Impala. We were hoping to watch the jackal resting. Look at these two squaring off a little bit. But a lot of displacement activity, okay? horning grasses and shrubs. Not really wanting to clash, but there's still dominance at play. So judging by our Sunday afternoon, everyone, this beautiful blue sky and clear view to eternity. You can virtually see the curvature of the planet. Which is fun. Looks like we're in for a good And all of this cold, misty morning rain and grayness is...
I would have loved to have found an LA, I would have loved to have found Sorry, I slid. Another hurt little hurt. Yeah, he's mine. You're doing this for all your life. You still call them a herd? A little troop of monkeys running across. There's a monkey with a baby on the belly. They're very shy. But they're also very exposed. They're running across an open patch of grassland. The trees don't offer very much. Um, there's one almost standing up upright just below the tree. And we'll see when this one jumps down. What it's doing is it's, it's looking through the grassland. They, they need to get a little bit of a height advantage to see where they're going and to be ensure that where they have to head to for the night is fairly free of predators. And when they're opening, or rather when they're crossing open grassland, they actually stand up on their hind legs and look above the grasses. Okay, nothing like a good branch to get the height advantage. Okay, I'm going to leave them be because they it's getting late and they need to be they need to be getting ready for bed ready to start the night. We need to be settling down for some fireside chat soon. Oh. Hmm. Okay, copy that. Somehow my radio switched off if you've been trying to get me. Guess not. binoculars must have hit the off button. Not my elbow. I have a notorious elbow and fortunately it hasn't been naughty this time around. Please do remember that we'll fireside chat this evening. Uh, one of us will be wired up to Alex and FC and he'll be sending us questions and maybe comments and things so if you do want us to address some issue or answer a question general question often we sort of just find questions that are relate to what we're seeing at the time and well relevant questions but it would be nice it keeps the conversation flowing and of course, gives the opportunity for Scott and I to actually bring up subjects and chat about them. That's what a fireside chat is all about. It's, it's chatting around a fire and maybe addressing some subjects or some things that are suggested by you, the viewers. And uh, hopefully we can, and uh, hopefully we can line up a few questions beside chat this evening. It'd be good. Bye-bye.
of stops and this big geese complaining about another goose arriving. Huge bachelor herd of impala, I can't believe how big they are. Bachelor of impala, bachelor wildebeest. I guess it calls for a goodbye boys. I'm wondering if these two zebra are maybe two stallions. And it's just a stag night out at the airstrip tonight. Except in Africa we should call it bulls night because we don't have stags, we just have bulls. Tell me if you hear an aeroplane because we just stopping to have a look here. I need my binoculars. Yeah, I saw that plover lying down. Nearly just had his head taken off by a swallow. Wondering if they've decided to nest on the airstrip. These are crowned plover. We saw the lesser blackwing earlier. And it could well be that maybe that just made a scraping there and she's sitting. And the rest are just sentries, all three of them. No, uh, oh. Did you see where she was sitting? There was nothing there. Well, you won't see anything though, because the eggs are speckled and the... Well, let's say goodbye to these boys. Oh, there's a wildebeest doing the phlegm and grimace. Could be a stallion and a colt and a bunch of male impala and a trio. Three stooges of the wildebeest clan. Interesting. As I say, boys night out on the airstrip. Whoops. And let me show you what they're looking at while they're eating. Let me show you what they're all eating to. They're eating to this sunset. So they like if we can do a sort of a, a pan maybe. Just the 180 of the airstrip at Arethusa. This is the life of a wildebeest, a zebra, or an impala. It's a set, it's really, it's, it's tough in Africa. Big blue skies, endless grasslands, and every now and then a predator you have to worry about. Beautiful, but open spaces. Who sang that song? It was a song called Wide Open Spaces. It was like Cheryl Crow or something. Kind of like a country song. Sorry Cheryl, if country is not your thing. So a few females. A small group of female impala with their lambs peering out of the bushes. They're not too sure if they want to enter the male's domain, but they're going to because, well, safety. With all those boys around, these girls are sure to have a safe night. Good night, children.
beautiful view. Actually, while we drive, I'm going to drive slowly, see if we can just... Maybe a bit more sky. Maybe a bit more sky. Yeah, I like that. Not too much sky. No, not too much sky. That is sky. Dixie Chicks. Thanks, Jennifer in New York. See? These are my peeps, they come up with answer for me pretty quickly. There's a brown snake eagle in the tree. Far away, brown snake eagle. Very distinct and unmistakable posture for the brown snake eagle. Now heading back towards Juma because we, we're quite a distance away. We don't want to get back there close to the time for our fireside chat. But I, I, I can't resist. I just simply can't resist. One of the wonders of having this weather that's just been, this whole weather system has just been through, is that it clears the air of smoke and fog and smog and all those other things. And we can actually see the escarpment in the Drakensberg Mountains. So from, let's see if we can just get a glimpse through here from the sunset moving over the escarpment. It's looking probably 100, 100 odd kilometers, maybe a bit more, maybe less. Way in the distance. That very, very high peak to the right, sort of the far right of your picture where that tree points up to it, that is probably the Maripskop signal station where there are a bunch of masts and a bunch of antennas and things. Really beautiful area. Moving further north of that is the little town of Hoodsprate. And this is the northern ridge in the northern reaches of the Drakensberg Mountains, the Dragon's Mountains. It looks like a dragon's back with all the, the undulations. And our Sunday sunset. Because if I have to drive to Juma right now, we're going to miss most of it, but I don't know, maybe we can find, kind of reverse a little bit, find a dead tree. Because technically it's still getting back closer to home. Even if it's going backwards, but I'd rather go backwards with the sunset than go forwards and have it behind us. I can smell an elephant too. Alien must. In fact, those trees with the brown snake eagle might find that is an excellent backdrop of the sunset. Oh! Can't see the bumps too well. But there, there, that's going to be the opening. That is, there's a big quarry bush in the way, but you know, you see where the eagle is up on the right, and you can 
imagine that in a few days time as the sun moves further north in the western sky one of these days we're going to have the sun setting directly behind that gorgeous tree where this brown snake eagle is but also we, here we are at sunset the sun is just just touching on the mountain right now And I'm guessing that it's about 6.40. Which isn't hard to do because I was told what the time is. Because we've got to get to Fireside Chat. And I'm also going to just go back a little bit to the other side of this quarry bush. Because this quarry bush then becomes, uh, it obscures our view for a second. And then on this side of the quarry and the terminalia in the front we've got another another sunset for you. So if I can't find animals I'll find you a sunset. almost wintry in fact because of the, the thinness to the air from this cold front because there's no cloud in the sky to reflect it like it does most of summer and in winter we have clear skies like this and this is very typical of our winter skies with not a cloud there are a few hanging over the mountain but mm, that's too beautiful and the eagle just flew The last of the last we're gonna see of it today. Bye bye sunshine. There's two copies on the right in the west, the western edge of the Sabi sand. That's where Ulusaba and Idube and Leopard Hills. Boom. Goodbye sunshine. See you tomorrow going to be a lovely day. Oh, by the way, just by the way, the brown snake eagle flew a little bit closer. Came to see what we were doing. Didn't want to miss out on the sunset. Lovely silhouette. Sideways, sideways bird. Didn't want to see that profile. I bet it's concentrating on something close by. It's intent on something because it's not even looking around. So either it's hunting or... It's... Oh. I think we'll drive forwards back to camp now. Back to
Eric Kajuma. Julia. Julia, a number of people have asked me to try and describe the smell of an elephant in must. It's not a, it, it's not a pleasant smell. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a sour smell. But it's not, it's not entirely repulsive to me at any rate I, I've, I've been with people that when they smell it they almost get nauseous or nauseous and I'm, I'm normally quite good at describing things but to be able to try and describe this particular smell very strong it's musky it's very funny. Quite a bit. But my players are starting to blur. I should twirl these, put them in curlers, wear a black hat. Franklin and the baby's just crossing the road. And luckily, they. Ah, the last one? Five, that's number five. Franklin and five children. Crested Franklin. Oh, sorry. Well, we now split the family because that must have been Mr. and Mrs. on that side. Sorry, she wanted to get out of the way so she can join the family. Sit in the middle of them. It's getting dark. They've got to be getting back to their roost as well. Um, it's pungent. It 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 is. Not, like nothing you've ever smelt before. I just wish I knew how to describe it better. Uh -huh. I mean, there's no just, there's no mistaking the maleness and the, the maleness of it and the testosteroneness of it. If, if, if that makes any sense. It is a kind of a smell that gets you... It's a kind of a smell that, that you understand that it's... That kind of smell only can only mean business. It's not, a, it's not like a scent. Not like something you want to bottle and sell. I don't know, I wish I could explain it better. It is it's repulsive. To me, it's not repulsive, but it is strong enough to be overpowering at times. That 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 too much of it. You need to spending too much time down with an alien bull in must. You need a bit of a breather from it. Best I can do, I guess. Oh.
Okay, copy that. I'm on Filament's cut line, just turned on to from uh, Gary Main, so I'm probably about eight minutes. Coordinating our time, time is arrival. So what do you, I hope you thought about things, some of you, sent some uh, things in to Alex. Obviously Twitter, I have to remember that, to mention that, you know, Twitter, the feed just keeps moving, so sometimes uh, the questions can get lost in the lower end of Twitter, but hopefully with the emails, they, 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 they don't move beyond where you have to cage back to look at them. Uh, so as long as you put something in the subject line, that's important as far as emails are concerned. By a chat question or something, it makes it easier for Alex to find it amongst the other emails. we haven't seen today of course is that our family of wildebeest and sort of maybe closer to the saga that we were witnessing yesterday maybe we're pretty sure that that's what happened but it would must be nice I suppose would be a bit of closure to see that that mama wildebeest has maybe moved on and that she's just reintegrating into the herd and accepted her lot because ultimately that's really what has to happen that happens all over Africa all the time with every single animal. Karuba felt it a few weeks ago. Okay, maybe we'll just pull in and carry on from from Wendy. Improvise. Sounds like we're having fast side signal issues now. Okay, copy that, Scott. I'm coming up to quarantine now. Cool, be there now. Cool, dude. Okay, so what we were doing, first, I suppose it's nice for you to know what, what's what. Really, what is what? Is that Jigger was supposed to set up so we could just broadcast from there and, well, She's not doing her thing. She's gone to sleep and we can't wake her up. Much like Wendy couldn't wake up this afternoon and we only got signal much later. So what we're gonna do is we're approaching fireside chat. We can probably even get a glimpse of maybe lights and fire through the trees as we come up onto quarantine. And then I'm gonna have a brief break while we sort of say goodbye to you and we'll so that we can just get this vehicle into place and get the lights set up and uh, we're not even going to switch off here so that we because we now know that we're broadcasting great from Wendy we're just going to turn in and uh, everything will be just fine we'll just have to rig up some microphones so to do that it'll take us a minute or two and shortly have to switch that other radio off because that will be here for my side chat Go. Wunderbar. Ganz schön. Alles ist gut. Und Bienvenido. Love the smell of wood smoke. 
notiert. Jetzt wird es böse. Okay, bye everybody, we'll see you shortly again. Turning into our fireside check and see you now from around the fire.